Section 18 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17a Queen's Discrowned. A tram in the open country always seems to me wrong. There is something so brutal, so casual and reckless about the way it tears across fields, bisects roads, shaves cottages and disregards, if it does not actually remove, landmarks. And all the way from Hildesheim, Joseph Leopold and I were thinking, from totally different standpoints, of the great and important town we were about to visit. He was, I knew, dreaming of the splendid, progressive, modern collection of parks and warehouses, theatres, picture palaces and shops, with the old part contemptuously tucked away in a circle of cramping villadom, like a bullet insisted that the doctors do not care to remove, in the midst of the new cells of Hanover's reconstituted modernity. But I was thinking, like the lover of Sainara, quote, of an old passion, unquote, of grim and lonely palaces given over to sightseers, of Herrenhausen and the Leineschloss, and piteous, discrowned queens. There were Sophia Dorothea and Caroline Matilda, the one of England, at least she ought to have been, and the other of Denmark. She only reigned a year. Sophia Dorothea accomplished in the old Leineschloss her dreary tragedy of royal neglect and the fatal consolations of a courtier. Caroline Matilda, the beautiful mismated sister of George the Third, came here weeping a wreck to Herrenhausen to drag out the remainder of her discredited existence in the red brick dower house that was the appanage of her relatives. This lady trailed her misery through cellar too, but cellar was connected only with the innocent fated youth of Sophia Dorothea, whose lover lies steeped in quicklime under the flags of the Rittersaal in the old palace of the electors of Hanover. And as we breathlessly traversed the flat Prussian plains, Joseph Leopold talked of what interested him more than mere romantic personalities about royal ladies, of the spirit of Germany, of the march of armies over those very fields, of how the smug little dwarfs that we saw dotting the plain were occupied, sacked, rifled and pillaged again and again by Wallenstein and Tilly and their soldiers of fortune. Yet my thoughts obstinately remained with the daughter of the Duke of Zell and Eleonore d'Albreuse, who should have been Queen of England, but died mere Duchess of Alden. And Alden is a little homestead not much bigger or more important than the seat of the humbler sort of country gentleman in the England of the eighteenth century. The love of an uncrowned queen is a sentiment implanted in the hearts of men. It is an old, old mental attitude, a schwärmerei, as the Germans would call it, that affects both sexes alike. It began, or who shall say it began, with Helen of Troy. It ended, and who shall say it has ended, with the ex-Empress Eugenie. Nowadays, the record of certain social movements in the daily papers enables us to reconstitute the picture of a graceful mourning figure descending at the Gare du Nord and driving to the Rue de Rivoli, named so by the great one of her family, and taking up her abode in the hotel that overlooks the gardens of her lost palace. On reading this item of fashionable news, do not we, most of us, have a sympathetic tremor? We say, how stoical, or else how callous. And we incline to the former theory. Physiologists will be likely to suggest as an explanation of the attitude of the wonderful old lady of eighty some sort of atrophy of the emotional centres. And that is the explanation for me. 
I hope it happens in the majority of cases of slow living deaths by imprisonment and dispossession. I cannot imagine, for instance, the high-spirited, selfish schoolgirl that modern historians tell us Mary Stuart was, settling down at Lochleven and Bolton and Fotheringay, supinely allowing her would-be rescuers to go to the scaffold one after another, and believe her to have remained the mercurial, highly sensitised being who landed at the port of Leith one summer's day with Chatelain in her train, and all the airs of France about her. Yet it would indeed seem that, barring the constant hope of rescue, a slight titillation of interest as regular and as journalier as to us, the morning paper on the breakfast table, Mary Stuart did settle down to her prayers and her rheumatism and the ordering of her household and the teasing of her custodians. And did not Caroline of Brunswick, whose coffin under its red velvet pall lies in the crypt in the family cathedral at Hanover, did not Caroline, witty, bitter and unwashed, did not she take refuge in cynicism, the employment of a ready tongue upon the castigation of the many weak points that characterised her vulnerable consort. Once in her hearty prime, she had adopted the tactics of a suffragette, and had demonstrated her wrong on the very spot where that wrong was focused, the abbey steps, where her unregenerate husband was managing to get himself crowned without her. And Sophia Dorothea, the wife of George I, she that should have been crowned Queen of England in the fullness of time, soothed herself during her thirty years of durance among the marshes of Alden, with elaborately mounting her not inconsiderable household, paying her bills regularly, seeing her stewards, and furiously driving within the bounds assigned to her by her ex-husband. Exceeding the speed limit was evidently her form of nerve derivative, and seems to have been her foible, her folly in earlier days, when her fate still hung in the balance. For Germans do not believe in and are deeply outraged by any signs of unseemly haste. Hers is a story of a coterie, a large and important coterie, of course, but one that but for some contentious souls in England and an accident of succession, would have remained a coterie, and his members could by no possibility have got mixed up with the royal family of Great Britain. And when it came to the point, the heroine of a German palace scandal could not be Queen of England. It is possible that if Sophia Dorothea had known or realised how near it was to her, if the truculent figure of the old electress had not stood all through her hot and heady years in front of her, a solid block to her hopes of a queenly future, she would have been more careful, and would have sacrificed love to ambition. But nothing seemed less likely than that George, disreputable, stockish, drunken, mulish George, should have a crown to give or withhold, as a reward for good court behaviour. No, Sophia Dorothea was just the rich heiress and only daughter of the Duke of Tsell, and George, the mumpish son of the electress, who might, par impossible, have some day to go over and reign in Great Britain. So old Sophia, while despising young Sophia's mother, the Frenchwoman, schemed to get the daughter's dowry for her son, and the poor little girl was brought from cellar, where a certain decency reigned, and pitchforked into the electoral court of Hanover, where she promptly went wrong. But her dowry was secured, and she now might be committed for any simple crime, tried by court-martial and whistled off, as indeed she was. Koenig's mark was a pretext. He was the usual adventurer. But the flighty woman loved him, and I think he loved her. I do not fancy that she was really at all interesting. 
she was very big and white and black-haired with rolling black eyes it is easy to see from her letters that her french mother had formed her in her own image and that in itself must have been an offence she was too previous she was resented as an early french fashion is sometimes resented in crassly suburban circles she began by flirting outrageously with everybody lying in bed all day dancing all night and crabbing the clothes of the ladies of the court notoriously those of countess platten her rival in her husband's affection and those of her father-in-law she mocked her husband's mother she mocked everybody and everything she behaved like a naughty child until the passion for Königsmark took hold of her and she became jealous and vapourish and tragic. She bolted once like any schoolgirl when they had all been too severe with her and went home to mother. But her husband, the elector, ordered her back and her mother was afraid to keep her. She took post horses and went back in a rage. I think I see her rushing full tilt past the in-laws palace of herrenhausen which is a short mile from hanover and on the way to the liner schloss the royal palace where she was bound to rejoin her peevish little husband in herrenhausen there sat the crusty old electress waiting to be propitiated by the naughty daughter-in-law stopping to pay her respects i see the little french fury enraged at her recall putting her black head out of the carriage window and bidding the postilions drive straight on. I see all the expectant heads of the electress's household craning out of the windows as the daughter and lord her escort were whirled past, and I hear the fateful pronouncement of the savage old woman, openly defied by the daughter of the little, quote, clot of dirt, so she styled the Duchess of Cellar that the daughter of the french lady who had got herself somehow or other into the family should ever be queen of england her own darling dream of succession voided for her by her own death was what the electress known as quote, the friend of the philosopher leibnitz unquote, but a narrow-minded old woman all the same set herself all along to prevent the doom of sophia dorothea may have been sealed from this moment of defiance less than a year after she was to be the uncrowned queen of england and reign merely over a sullen marsh these family jealousies were of course not all there is generally to be found a splendid adventurer at the back of these fair outcasts from royal edens guarded by flaming swords Three gentlemen of fortune were connected with the three ladies I have mentioned, Bergami, the wretched Italian chamberlain and supposed lover of Caroline of England, may be reckoned negligible, but Bothwell, Königsmark, and our lad Struensee, cunning doctor who became a minister, the, quote, blood-red ray in the spectrum, unquote, of the life of Caroline Matilda, a steward on her mother's side, and Sophia Dorothea's ancestress, these gentlemen were kindred spirits. They were nearly all of them, not so much in love with the queen that stooped, as anxious to use her favour for their own ends of ambition. There is no doubt that Bothwell found Mary Stuart a great drag on his domestic bliss. He much preferred his own wife, a Huntley, to the royal lady he was so busy exploiting of count struensee to the exposition caroline matilda was not much more than a political pawn out of all the three philip count Königsmark, was the most ardent the most reckless the least calculating for though we have naturally mary stuart's dead giveaway the famous casket letters which I, for my part, believe to be genuine, where are the letters of Bothwell to Mary? Was not the astute borderer too cautious to write letters? And did he not plead 
the rough, unskilled hand of a man of the moss hags. But Königsmark's letters to Sophia Dorothea are extant, each one a hanging matter. And hers to him were found by the late Mr. W. H. Wilkins in the University Library of Lund in Sweden. He translated them. These letters breathe, hers and his, a savage and tender passion that is incontestably genuine, love marred by temper, vanity and sensuality, but still love, that rises sometimes to wild heights of selflessness. They amply prove the point which, as usual in these cases, some Sophia laters are found to contest. Here would our superior moralist Thackeray says about it, quote, Innocent. I remember as a boy how a great party persisted in declaring Caroline of Brunswick was a martyred angel. So was Helen of Greece innocent. She never ran away with Paris, the dangerous young Trojan. Men allows her husband ill-used her, and there was never any siege of Troy at all. So was Bluebeard's wife innocent. She never peeped into the closet where the other wives were with their heads cut off. She never dropped the key or stained it with blood, and her brothers were quite right in finishing Bluebeard. Yes, Caroline of Brunswick was innocent, and Madame Lafarge never poisoned her husband, and Mary of Scotland never blew up hers, and poor Sophia Dorothea was never unfaithful, and Eve never took the apple. It was all a cowardly fabrication of the serpents. Unquote. It is all very amusing, but surely the ironic method was never so laid on him with a trowel before. Thackeray was shocked. He was very early Victorian, and so that was easily done. Sophia Dorothea was very different from Amelia, and her home life at Cellar and Hanover was not at all like Amelia's in Russell Square. Thackeray shouts praise grudgingly of his German heroine, quote, How madly true the woman is, and how astoundingly she lies, unquote. Amelia was true, but soberly, and never, as children would say, lied big. She was not a tragic heroine at all, except perhaps for one moment at Waterloo. And yet we see, as we are able to do with tragic heroines whose letters get published, how petty are the causes leading to the difficulties which broaden out to such issues of life and death. Sophia Dorothea worried, bullied, nagged, and practically hunted her man to his doom. It is fairly obvious in such corrupt entourage as hers, and she saw it too, when not blinded by jealous fury, that if she had allowed Königsmark to be civil in the then-received manner to her father-in-law's ugly, all-powerful mistress and favourite, Countess von Platten, the Count would have lived to run away with her to France or England, or even to the enlightened court of Waltenbüttel. Footnote. It was in a precisely similar way that Guillaume de Cabestain, the noble troubadour, was discovered by the husband of the princess he adored. He wrote various poems to her ladies in order to ward off suspicion, alleging to his mistress that these were the common and necessary politenesses of the day. She, however, insisted that he must address to her still more passionate poems, and one stanza in the famous verses beginning Les du Cossir betrayed the troubadour to the husband, who cut out his heart and made the lady drink his blood. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. Or even to the enlightened court of Wolfenbüttel, Duke Antony of Ulrich, the enemy of Hanover lived there. The dissipated, dilettante relation who afterwards cast his niece's adventures in the form of a romance and passed it round to all the courts of Europe who were deeply interested. Evasion was their plan, frustrated by the follies of both. It was more or less arranged between them, and it was a plan that had recommended itself to the worldly, hard-headed adventurer, 
that he should accept some of the Countess Platten's frequent invitations to supper, the public ones, where each man took his lady to dine at some cabaret en vie, for all the world as people make up to go to some low restaurant nowadays, and the private ones as well in La Patten's quote, castle behind the mill, unquote, to supper. Königsmark was a success at these parties, except when the electoral princess of Hanover had scolded him. Then he undid his work, refusing to sit down to the collation, walking about the room singing, or throwing himself down among the new-mown hay in the garden, and not saying a word till it was time to go. He was the handsomest man in Europe, and Europe spoilt him. Sophia Dorothea had written to him, what? Go to La Platten's supper party? Two hours after I had gone? And when you had bidden me so tender a farewell? You had no end of pretexts for declining that supper party, and yet you went. I tremble for the future. Unquote. And well she might. And this after another letter which runs, quote, don't be so silly as to keep away from La Platten altogether. It is most important to keep her in a good humour. Therefore, for the sake of our love, go there as before. Unquote. Königsmark, to please her, insists on forswearing the Countess, and she writes again to rebuke him for his submission to her orders. Quote, I am sorry that you no longer go to Countess Platten's, it is rather important that you should go. Unquote. Don't think of inducing me to return to La Platten, Königsmark replies. You will not catch me that way any more. And further, to pacify the jealous lady, he adds the detail of the Platten's quote, ridiculous yellow cloak. Unquote. The silly princess jumps at it. Quick comes her reply. She is, quote, his, all his. For her mother-in-law, the electress, has corroborated his strictures on the cloak, telling Sophia's mother, quote, that nothing could be more hideous, unquote, than the said cloak. The magic of the spiteful innuendo does not last. Königsmark gives a party and omits to mention the fact that he has invited La Platten to it. Quote, so the whole thing was got up for her, unquote, is the conclusion Sophia Dorothea jumps to, and very meanly throws a potential rival in his face. Fortune, she says, to give me revenge, has sent hither today a young baron from Mayence, unquote. How truly tragic it is, the useful young baron from Mayence, La Platten's yellow cloak, Königsmark sulking among the haycocks to placate his beloved, in the face of the dangers the two were running. A lazy, idle court full of spies, drink and gambling sensuality run riot. How could a fairly pure passion be allowed to subsist? For it is obvious, as even Thackeray admits, that these two were passionately attached, and that the princess was devoted to, quote, Lothario, one knew that Thackeray would have nothing better to do than call him Lothario. He writes humbly and pathetically as to the social event which has upset Sophia Dorothea so much, quote, My banquet, as you call it, was a very dull affair. La Platten came with her husband, unquote. And he tells the exigeante beauty once for all what his social philosophy is. It is quite in order for the present day. So might a modern Belgravian called to account by his great friend try to get into her obstinate head the cutlet for cutlet theory. Quote, My reason for giving the supper party was because I am going away so soon. Note to the wars, not to the moors. And it was the right thing to do. I have been so often to their dinners that it was necessary for me to make some return. 
do not think I did it to court any one or with any thought of intrigue. I vow on my perdition it was not so. As a man I am compelled to do many things that you as a woman need not do. Sometimes we must worship the devil, lest he should harm us. Unquote. It must be admitted that Königsmark went a very long way with the devil. That sinister castle behind the mill, deep and bowed in trees, secluded, dark, where the jolly countess entertained her favourites. To damn me, says poor Königsmark, she asked me to supper there. And he adds in self-deprecation, half sullen, half combative, since the lady herself had counselled the step, quote, it was a gross insult to my love for you, for which I mean to see you at my feet, begging my pardon. You cannot love me as much as I love you, for at your bidding I have sinned against my love for you. Unquote. Yes, it was high policy to dignify by that name a low form of courtier-like trimmings, higher than the egotistic princess could stand, although she had cynically counselled it. And the doomed Königsmark comes to see clearly how she is likely to react. He, moreover, sincerely loathes himself for his paltering with the evil one. He ends by vowing first on his perdition, then on his salvation, that he will see the Countess no more be the consequences what they may. Quote, I will never see her again, though it ruin me. Unquote. It did ruin him. If he had even stuck to that bold attitude, he announced, it might have availed him somewhat. But he continued to kowtow to the favourite in a faint-hearted way, and the favourite, preserving her weakness for him, held her hand for a space. At last the princess, committing herself to her mad passion before the eyes of the whole court, contrived so to rub in the fact of his infidelity to La Platen. Yes, it had all the while looked like that to the countess, who, considering herself sure of his heart, had doubtless winked at and permitted a courtier-like adoration of the electoral princess as the proper attitude of an adventurer, that she at last decided to destroy him, fresh from the arms of her rival. At least, that is the story. No one really knows how it went that summer night in June, after which Königsmark was not seen again. But this is how tradition says she managed it. Four clumsy halberdiers, lent to La Platten by the sleepy old elector, her lover, whom she disturbed with a scandalous tale of his captain of the guard alone with his imprudent daughter-in-law at the dead hour of night these men were to arrest Königsmark to take him dead or alive they took him dead an ambush behind the great convenient stove and the ritasal through which the happy lover must pass on his way out a blow in the back a lighted torch held up and the most beautiful face in the world Everybody grants him that. Spoilt. Trodden under an angry, revengeful woman's heel. Then a flag taken up, some quick lime, and all quiet when day dawned. And Sophia Dorothea left with his parting kisses on her lips, among her torn-up compromising papers, some of them only torn across, or we should have no data, and her jewel caskets and other preparations for tomorrow's flight, probably lay down to snatch a few moments' sleep, expecting to be roused next morning early by that little note from her lover that was to be the signal for her departure, the note that never came. Knesebeck, la confidante, heard sounds in the night but thought nothing of them. It was a fortnight before Sophia Dorothea, kept a prisoner in her wing of the old Leinerschloss, knew that her lover was lost, and not then officially. Everybody all over Europe, led by his sister, the amiable adventurous Aurora von Königsmark, 
was hunting for the elector's handsome colonel of the guards but a sardonic remark of that potentate's reported to her must have left her with small doubt it was to the effect that Koenig's mark was not likely to appear again in Hanover. However, Sophia Dorothea was kept shut up. Her children were not allowed to see her. She knew nothing of the robust Aurora's hearty search for her brother. Such refinements of cruelty were permissible in these vicious little circles. The amenities of small ducal courts must have been very like those of neighbouring tribes of savages, and the constant haggling over Sophia Dorothea and her money, at the time of her marriage and at the time of her divorce, might be fairly translated by the rites of marriage by capture, the raids of braves, and the exchanging of cows and women in Zululand. In the princess's despair, she threw the cup after the platter, as the saying is, and played into her cunning husband's hands. He wanted to get rid of her and keep her money. He did not want to mention the Königsmark affair, it was repugnant to his pride, and if the princess could be strengthened in her expressed determination not to return to her husband, then she could be easily put away for desertion according to the German law. The name of Königsmark was skilfully kept out of it. The confidant was made the scapegoat and imprisoned. It was Frau von Knesebeck's counsels which had corrupted the princess, who was sent into exile at Lahnau, quote, until such time as she returns to her duties with the electoral prince, unquote. A farce. He wanted none of her duties. He had the Maypole and the Maypole's child. The divorce proceedings that were then inaugurated were a farce, as divorce proceedings so often are. The cell of people, represented by her indefatigable mother, the Duchess Eleonor, wanted a separation. The Hanoverians, that is to say her husband, a divorce. The ill-advised princess readily gave him his wish. She believed that freedom would have followed the pronouncing of the divorce. So she duly showed a rebellious spirit, come to Machia, and declared freely to the commissioners, that nothing would induce her to return to her electoral consort. Later, like Mary Stuart, Sophia Dorothea intrigued constantly for freedom, but attempts to escape, conducted by letter, were not a hanging matter, and besides, all her friends turned out to be in the pay of her enemies, except the plucky Knesebeck, who escaped from prison and worked hard for her mistress. I should like to have known Knesebeck. She stood up so gallantly for the theory of the princess's innocence, and whether that theory was tenable or not, it was right and fitting for La Confidante to hold it. Another person held the theory and supported it in a book. But then, as the shrewd old Duchess of Orléans observed, quote, it was only to save the honour of the house, unquote. This was a relation, the literary duke, Antony Ulrich of Wolfenbüttel. His novel was called Octavia. It was that exceedingly modern performance, Roman à clé. Sophia Dorothea figures as the Princess Solane. Her husband, George Louis, is romantically disguised as Prince Cotis. Koenig's mark is Aquilius. This official account of a world-renowned family incident was read eagerly by every court in Europe. The Duchess of Orléans, like any gossiping, idle old lady of our day, anxious to be amused in her twilight of life she was a great stir about in her time writes to yes actually the electress sophia the mother of cotis and mother-in-law of salan saying i'm going to read the octavia over again as george louis yes actually george louis himself has been good enough to send me the key to it 
the cynicism of this would have delighted Thackeray, Duke Ulrich makes Solana appear innocent, she adds, unkindly suggesting the obvious family reason for his backing. She is diplomatic about George Louis, as she is writing to the youth's mother. Coties, she observes, coties I consider cold, not brutal. Not brutal. And while she wrote, perhaps the uncrowned queen was driving furiously down the road to the bridge at Hayden with her escort of drawn swords and black despair in her heart. And then the Duchess has another dig at the victim of the coldness of Prince Cody's quote. Duke Christian looks on it as an improvement that she stuck to one in particular, unquote. Now, the good Duchess herself admits to finding safety in numbers. She is, moreover, curious as to whether George Louis, who so obligingly furnishes the key to the urgent family document, has any hankering to see his wife, quote, who is still beautiful. Yes, Sophia Dorothea is fifty, and she is still beautiful. And if, when he succeeded to the throne of Great Britain, George Louis could have taken her with him as his consort, it would have helped to popularise the Hanoverian regime. But no one ever said he wasn't shrewd, and he knew the sort of woman he had to deal with. He knew Sophia Dorothea, her bitter French tongue, her German obstinacy, and he thought it safer to give out that he was a widower, or if he had a wife, that she was mad. He made both excuses, apparently. The Jacobites would peck at him either way. At the same time, he had the Queen guarded even more closely than before, as closely as he dared, without at the same time injuring her health. He had a purely selfish reason for this. A fortune-teller had assured him that he would not survive her six months. Prince Cotes valued life. And when Sophia Dorothea died, she raved, she denounced her husband, and she wrote, the story says, a letter to be delivered after her death. It was delivered nine months after to the king when he landed on his biennial visit to Hanover. It gave him the stroke from which he did not recover. It is almost too dramatic to be true. It is difficult to believe that an omen could be so fully justified. But dates do not lie. No, not if you get them right, which I always find difficulty in doing. End of section 18 Section 19 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17, Part 2, Queen's Discrowned Without being a Sophia later, I was deeply interested in this story of social doom and murder, and in my own way. I was chafed, as I suppose my relators, and even Sophia Laters, have been and will be chafed to the end of time, by people whose imaginative faculty cannot be set going by anything but tragedies where the element of heroism or grandeur comes in. My friends kindly escorted me to Hanover that I might batten upon the relics and evidence of the coot, which it pleases them to say is mine, but they did not contrive that my morbid tastes should be fully fed and gratified by a sight of the very flag in the corridor of the Rittersaal, the corridor is parquet now, under which lies the body of Königsmark, the man who wrote those letters, the man who flirted with Countess Platten, the man who noticed the yellow cloak, the man whose mouth was stamped upon, who was hastily sepultured, doused with quicklime on that night in June. This particular spot in the old Liner Schloss was the eye of the picture, and I was never inside the Liner Schloss. As we drove to Herrenhausen, we were due to pass it, 
So the guidebooks said, but the guidebooks were in German. Not until after the heat and battle of the day were over, when things had been missed and the conduct of the excursion opened to be severely criticised by the people who had been glad to profit by some self-constituted Cicerone's superior knowledge of German and historical proportion, did I realise the omission. What we did on that warm April day was to drive in a hired fly solemnly round the residential quarter of Hanover for an hour. This is the only way to learn what Germany really is, so my German friends told me. I did not deny it. Only the suburbs of a town are depressing everywhere, and a drive in a taxi cab round and round, say, Hamilton Terrace or Addison Road, would produce just the same effect and stand for Germany just as well. Footnote. A reasonable interest in the monuments of the past is a very proper thing, but to confuse the disorderly array of houses which are to be found in the London suburbs with the carefully planned and extremely interesting groups of dwellings that surround modern German cities is evidence of a mind ill-trained to observation in its infancy and unaware of the most urgent of civic problems of the present day. The outskirts of Hanover are the very best model for the outskirts of London, and just as this city in the past gave to England reasonable and utilitarian rulers, so she might today, to the same country, give plans for a reasonable and utilitarian development of modern cities, which can never be very romantic things. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. On the road to Herrenhausen, under the long bordered avenue that reminded me of the old birdcage walk, we did pass a dull, ugly, negligible building, and the eager, polite Kutcher made a small detour to drive us past the facade, where the white horse of Hanover stood and ramped like a great grey full-fed ghost. The horse was impressive, and reconciled me to the detour, and that was all. But this was the old Leinerschloss, modernised outside, but practically unchanged within. Here this conjuries of ill-conditioned, ill-tempered people lived and loved and festered in their unwholesome pleasures and shabby, squalid vices. The family history of this family beats most hideous family histories, baiting that of the Chenchi and the House of Judah. Well, there it was. All these tragedy folk had patted about, been born, married, murdered, and died in their sanctimonious beds. Here. They had worthy and unworthy all dreed their weird behind these grey, unattractive walls. And I was driven past it. Joseph Leopold, you see, had the guidebooks and he did not care for the old shell, the withered slough of squalid, politically uninteresting folk. I told him a little story of my youth. I had a witty mother, and I had what was known as the Irving craze very badly in my girlhood. I had just seen the divine actor in Richard the Third and I was taken over Barnard Castle in Yorkshire, one of the palaces of the Kingmaker. I betrayed an unusual interest in historical detail concerning the Tudors, the Nevilles, and the House of York. I plagued everybody for information. I insisted on going over the ruined castle from Garrett to Oubliette. I bored the party who wanted food and less historical detail. At my last question, my mother turned. Yes, she said, Henry Irving did give this castle to Miss Isabel Bateman, and now let's all go and have tea. The disappointment about the Leinerschloss was wiped out a little further along the road. We came to the Herrenhausen, a yellowish, fawn-coloured building of a cheap style and fabric, low and crouching. That is how the Stammhaus of the Hanoverian kings of England appeared to me. I did not think it so very like Kensington Palace. I had always been told it was a copy. 
Kensington Palace is stately, rather high, of a dark, dignified red brick. The stateliness of Kensington may be due to the new chimney stacks added in early Victorian days to the commanding ridge of the coping stones all along the face and tinkered up quite lately since it became a museum. But the mean, cheap-looking yellow and white plaster that covers the bulk of the palace of Herrenhausen hopelessly belittles it. All the German palaces are said to be copies of Versailles. Kensington Palace is far more like Versailles than Herrenhausen. We drove, as it seemed to me, for nearly a quarter of a mile along a low range of little houses like a row of Pitman's cottages in England, but painted yellow and white in a garish crudity that would not appeal to an Englishman. These little one-storey dwellings, one door, two windows, built obviously for coachmen and officials attached to the royal service, led the eye gradually to a main building into which they melted, and I said, this must be Herrenhausen. Kensington Palace necessarily housed its multiplicity of officials, its grooms and stablemen, but their establishments do not and did not form part of the main façade. The arrangement of the German palace is less snobbish, perhaps. We know the Georges were very simple folk. There is a humble building just inside the great gate of Kensington Gardens, where one used to buy soda water and ginger beer and gingerbread biscuits in 1870. It was then exactly like the little erections of which I speak that are annexed to the Palace of the Georges in Herrenhausen. In Kensington Gardens, the little square box of a house still stands, but it is no longer painted yellow, and I don't think you can get soda water there any more. We got out. The palace in front of us gleamed a chalky white and yellow in the raw spring sunlight. There was an acre of small cobblestones in front of it, and a sufficiency of ostlers, pails and pumps, with brooms propped up against them. No human being could be seen. The windows all had formal linen blinds, and these blinds were drawn. The palace is not shown. It is not shown because it is actually inhabited by the owner, and yet it is empty. There was nothing very romantic about the lust house of a fat, stupid, boozy family like that of the Georges, but now for the first time romance has entered its doors. This is what I thought when Joseph Leopold told me the reason of the present state of affairs. Herrenhausen is the property of an exile for conscience' sake, the Duke of Cumberland, the proscribed King of Hanover. Footnote. This was written in 1912. End footnote. He cannot live in his own house, in his own kingdom, because he is subject to arrest. He refuses and has refused for years to take the oath of allegiance to Prussia. How very vital, looking on this death in life of a fair mansion, this shell of an ineffectual royalty, seemed the principle for which this man and his family are fighting, and for whose abstract sake endure an honoured but nomadic existence. You might have met the dispossessed duke anywhere during the last twenty years in England, opening bazaars at the baths and cures of his country, at any of the cities excepting the one city where he properly belonged. You might have met him in Berlin, on the Unter den Linden, maybe. I fancy the Kaiser and he were not bad friends, they were at any rate relatives. Yet if he had walked into his own principality of Hanover, he was liable to be arrested at sight, like a malefactor. He has chosen his line. Herrenhausen is inhabited, though no one is in it. At his other country seat, Wilhelmsburg, he keeps thirty beds made up. All this is on the chance of his being able, through some change in the political arena, to swoop down upon his own and occupy it. 
is it not romantic to think that in this opportunist stage there is still a potentate who prefers exile to abasement our kircher was excessively anxious that we should first of all visit the towering glass-domed conservatory opposite the palace which was built and presented to the inhabitants of hanover by their very generous prince but the mere sight of it made my eyes ache so we paid him and allowed him to abandon us in front of the building in the fond hope that he had brought us to where we wished to be to the haven of our desires remember he had been bidden to drive us round the suburbs of hanover merely taking the old town on our way he must have been terribly out in his calculations of our tastes but we walked on we passed the glass house of the duke of cumberland we have no better at kew we never looked round or else we would have seen our cicerone's despair of his client's curious obtuseness and faulty sense of direction and in that part of the garden so casually attained to i had a vision or shall i call it an adventure not of versailles but of herrenhausen i seemed to myself to be in a dream as i walked soberly quiet as a tourist mouse by the side of joseph leopold i did not even take his arm though i was possessed by a strange emotion of fear lest i should totter and call for support during this excursion into my subconscious as indeed it was supposing i felt the need for readjustment of time and space of the past with the present i might grasp this kind german convexity and be saved from falling but i hoped all the while that this would not happen for i was enjoying the furtive emotion raised to me with all my might of conscious sensation we were walking actually in a small rectangular garden bordered on one side by high-cut hedges and on the other by low pollarded willows on the edge of what i apprehended then to be water though as a matter of fact i believe there was no water there the lowness of the willows and the light of flatness reminded me of a dutch landscape and the semi-enclosed space where we were walking suggested the foreground of a piece of medieval tapestry with its weft of dull green and warp of strange vividly picked out flowers there is a morris wallpaper called the daisy that was constantly hung and renewed in my old home which has something of the same effect as the parterre in which joseph leopold and i were now walking there were two narrow and rectangular strips of grass dotted spotted in the regular medieval fashion of tapestry with yellow and white flowers borne up on strong limber upstanding stems like the spears of grass that interspersed them which was likewise firm and broad and tall and at the end of the formal strip lost diminished in a sort of exaggerated dream perspective was a small grey greek temple it occupied the whole breadth of the end of the rectangular strip of green and it had a background of dark sacrificial trees i think that we use and we walked orderly along i fancy at one point there was a kind of check to the integrity of my vision the sight of our late kutcher standing by the opening in the yew hedge waving his arms and crying nicht da nicht da we had passed the glass dome unnoticed and were walking in a mere wilderness of strong weeds daisies and dandelions on my bemused ears too there smote the healthy sound of the whetstone at work on one of the gardener's sides but we walked on towards the temple that stood for us like a full stop of solemnity to the flowery commas that led up to it it was merely a tool house where wheelbarrows and mowing machines were propped against ionic columns green with damp but it had served probably for all sorts of lumbering german fête champêtre and there periwigged gentlemen and painted patched ladies had quote languidly adjusted their vapid loves unquote. now small grey posse sinister serious 
it served to put the finishing touch to the submergence of my consciousness under waves of memory. I definitely then lost all sense of time and place as I walked along self-supporting beside Joseph Leopold. The kutscher with the waving arms faded away, the sound of the scythe being sharpened somewhere in the neighbourhood to cut down the robust flowers and grass died out, and I became again a child in Kensington Gardens, unconscious of impressions, as all children are, but possessed of the usual plastic memory that stores up unvalued mind pictures wherewith to overwhelm the mature intelligence in the years to come. For the scene was so nearly identical as to act as a reminder. But in those days, instead of Joseph Leopold and the Kutcher, there was a palace official, two German nurses talking to each other on the other side of a slight iron fence composed of two thin transverse bars, and four small children divided equally by these bars. The two, of which I was one, were in stout boots and socks and bore hoops and hoop sticks. The other two were throned in a chaise drawn by a white donkey. There was a red brick palace in the background and a Greek temple in plaster behind. A babel of different German patois rent the air. The two children inside were very young and only liked their hands stroked. They were little techs, and the palace was Kensington Palace. But the Westphalian nurse of the children of Alfred Hunt the painter could not long be allowed to exchange ideas and dialects with the Hessian nurse of the future Queen of England, and the stern official in charge of the little royal party warned our Milly from Paderborn that it must not be. The white donkey on this last morning of many mornings passed on firmly and finally. But not until I left that rectangular strip of grass and flowers did I become middle-aged again, and Joseph Leopold never knew, only was a little mildly interested when I gripped his arm and pointed at the temple, just as a few drops of rain began to fall. In the days to which I had been temporarily switched back, we should have taken refuge, nurse, children, perambulator and all, in that temple, and bored ourselves with playing hide-and-seek round the pillars. There were plenty of Greek temples like this in Kensington Gardens in the old times. A little later on, in the tiny family museum at Herrenhausen, I took license to linger long over certain presses full of mouldy, faded garments of all sorts, coats laced with pale gold and silver that had graced a George's broad chest, and narrow-chested, high-shouldered dresses that had held the firm, proud flesh of queens, but now flapped dispiritedly on hooks, or on dummies that seemed to shrink away and refused to bear out these royal rags with any pride. I noticed during a lull of the irritating old ex-military custodian's voice a velvet cape of a faded mousy brown. Its paleness moved me more than eloquence. I remember wearing one very like it myself in the fifteen years ago that seems now so much more early than even early Victorian. This little wretched wrap was hidden away behind some garments that had belonged to Caroline Matilda, Sophia's descendant and another discrowned queen. Caroline Matilda was the sister of George the Third. She was supposed to be beautiful, but she had thick lips and a stumpy figure. It is possible to judge, for she was evidently a very dressy sort of person, so that clothes of hers are constantly cropping up in museums. She was supposed to be clever, for she could quote to be or not to be very much à trop and à travers. They married her to a sottish King Christian of Denmark, whose mother Juliana got rid of her on a possibly trumped-up story of infidelity as soon as was convenient, executed her supposed lover, and bestowed the daughter-in-law with her Hanoverian relations for the end of her days. 
she would have fared worse if she had not been a daughter of england and a subject for the interposition of lord keith england's ambassador both their dreary queenships must have worshipped in the hideous wrecked blue tinged chapel at cellar and prayed kneeling in their little close stuffy royal pews for moral support and better days that never came adding if one knows them at all a touch of the combination service a l'adresse of spiteful stepmothers-in-law named respectively sophia and juliana both must have dragged their ugly heavy clothes and heavier hearts along the pleached walks among the boxwood mazes of the palace of herrenhausen must have appeared and disappeared and reappeared again behind those high chamis designed one supposes to mask secret meetings but where the singed moths of scandal now wander alone for what courtier would dare to repeat the disastrous flirtations that had cost both konigsmark and struensee their lives one dress labelled as that of caroline matilda's looked as if the careless despairing wearer had subjected it to very rough treatment the delicate peach blossom silk had been dragged through wastes of autumn leaves i was sure of it it was spring now but i knew the place where in the fall of the year the brown dusty parchment-like flakes must have lain in heaving drifts under the trees that had borne them when the custodian was not attending i stooped and examined the hem of that dress yes it was discoloured and it turned up weakly pathetically just as my own dresses do if i let them trail in inappropriate places the years were dissolved for the moment as the custodian droned on about the glories of some royal george or other male relations of this oppressed female of their blood there was so little between me a woman staring through the past with a travel-stained skirt on of my own probably and another woman who had been so unhappy some hundred years ago or so that she had not troubled to hold up her gown as she tramped aimlessly through an autumn-coloured park the fallen leaves billowing flying up all round her knees clad in the neglected peach-blossom silk that didn't matter now that she was alone yes i am sure she walked alone she was thinking of the days when things were nicer as women say when she walked in the gardens at kew or kensington and there were no dead leaves and but servile people buzzing about her listening politely to her misquotations of shakespeare or later of the short sweet time in copenhagen when she was a crowned queen with a disagreeable mother-in-law a brutish husband but consideration and a crown now i tucked the dress back in the glass cupboard and sneaked back into the wake of the custodian feeling chilly and grown old end of section nineteen Section 20 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Bones, Babies and Anabaptists. There are in Münster, where we are going, 269 of my relations. Joseph Leopold observed footnote. There are 316. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote as the train ambled along by the side of the vast northern heath the luneburger heide which corresponds somewhat to the new forest in england it is to my mind a much more healthy heath than the new forest which contains every kind of scenery except mountain scenery and trees and rivers and plenty of those park-like enclosures dear to the land agent the luneburger heath is just an immense tract of land covered with low scrubby arid-looking undergrowth where stooping turf-cutters heap up heavy clods 
and gather sticks and cutling into bundles to make beds for their cattle and perhaps for themselves i answered politely as i sat beside him and looked out of the window and shall i have to know them all eventually we must go soon and formally pay our respects to my cousin a the head of our house but today i am going to show you minster and it will be amusing to see how many head of relation i can pass in the streets while i am going about with you incognito i want to see those low quiet arches all along the main street where the anabaptists made their last stand and were cut down as they ran in and out behind and past the pillars what i want to see are the bones of john of leyden in the iron cage slung on the church tower are you certain they are still there surely they were there gleaming white among the jackdaws when i was a boy replied joseph leopold staidly it was all right as regards the relations they were everywhere they might have been the offspring of john of leyden and his innumerable wives did we take shelter in the old palace during a shower did we tenant the old pilasters of the porte cochere in company of a whole many of pigtailed schoolgirls who were set down by a zealous schoolmistress to draw these pillars till that shower should leave off joseph leopold would nudge me and pointing out one of these pigtailed mansion that's one or did we cross the street and duck under the shadow of the dark historic arches we had come to see a lame man with a child will be looking in at a pastry cook's window that's cousin a and his little grandchild or did we meet a little way out towards the public gardens a young lady going to seek her partners in a game of tennis that's one of fritz's girls or a beautiful mature woman seen through the windows of the confectioners where she's ordering her kuchen for tea is my cousin laura it was uncles uncles everywhere and cousins flung in my path like mad presently i was bidden to look into a shop window and see the page of the minster daily journal owned edited and printed by one of my new relations then i was taken to see the dreary but handsome hospital given by the family collectively then to the large family mansion in the palladian style was it where quote, my granduncle unquote, lived and died and the church quote, my people unquote, had built and the other church that they preferred to worship in all this ancestor worship left me rather cold i am as i have said of the undomestic race that scorns family ties at last we came to the savatier platz a little green triangle at the back door of that old family mansion here to this lonely square of carefully tended green grass every little joseph leopold including the one who was telling me about it is taken out at a certain appropriate age with every formality to make his first tottering footsteps there were his father and his grandfather made theirs in leading strings and supported by parents and grandparents and a proud responsible nurse and when i had heard all about the ancestor who was burgomaster of minster and who had to drink a whole silver cockful of wine at one draught under pain of forfeiting his proud position and had been shown the very silver cock preserved in the friedensaal i was allowed to gratify my own morbid tastes raise my eyes and removing my centre of interest from these family matters look up at the tall tower of saint servatius and pick out the cage containing the bones of john of leyden and his lieutenant knipperdolling john of leyden the tailor alias john bocklesen alias the king of righteousness alias the king of zion must have been a very terrible forcible villain strong proud and lustful he came a refugee from leyden along with his first lieutenant a baker from harlem to avoid the persecutions going on there against the reformed religion and chose minster in westphalia because minster was favourable to the new ideas 
and had lately taken the strong step of turning its Catholic bishop out of the city. But the citizens had hardly bargained for the lusty tailor in his stead. The baker from Harlem having been killed in a sortie, John chose another lieutenant, a draper this time, with the ridiculous name of Knipperdolling. Yes, they are comic characters enough, both of them, till we think of the red-hot pincers and knives for flaying and the iron cages hung high on St. Lugerius, with the few white bones lying on the barred floor dropping gradually through the chinks onto the heads of the excessively Catholic posterity below. For as good Mrs. Markham remarks, quote, Minster ever since that time has been one of the most bigoted popish cities in Europe, unquote. That is the way it always is, and that is why the Joseph Leopolds pullulate in it. The new chief of insurrection began his reign by running stark naked through the streets of Minster, screaming that the King of Zion had come, while Knipperdonning incited the mob to pull down the steeples. Then began a period of almost incredible laisser aller. As, Mrs. Markham says, but is unable to go into the reasons thereof for fear of shocking young George and Mary, quote, the number of females who flocked to the enfranchised town of Minster was six times greater than that of the men, unquote. John counted it politicable, and indeed necessary, to decree that all men should treat themselves to a plurality of wives. He took to himself seventeen and we look up again at the cage with the rotting bones. At first it was free wives and free meals, and men and women ate together at public tables set in the public street. But the dispossessed bishop, armed and accompanied by the forces of law and order, laid siege to the perverted city, and it behoved the king of righteousness to put it in a state of defence. Boys stood beside the men on the walls and shot arrows onto the besiegers, while the women poured boiling oil onto their heads. Then famine reared its head as famine will on these occasions. But still John of Leiden, predestinated, mad, drunk with power, married wives, and attired them sumptuously, and lived with them and his lieutenants on the diminishing provisions of the garrison, so that the common people starved though they, and they alone, carried on the defence of Minster. One wife, Elizabeth, history says, expostulated with the madman who ruled all and put in a plea for the starving population, pointing out that John himself was meanwhile living in unstinted, unheard-of luxury. He struck off her head picturesquely with his two-handed sword and then danced round her body with his other wives, including, I suppose, the fair Divara, who was chief among them. I think one ought to be able to make a play out of all these incidents and the strange, mad, picturesque scoundrels who had their fun and then paid the price for it. For the city was stormed and the Anabaptists put to the sword. And seeing those low-browed, stunted arches that are built in a wavering, sagging line over the flagged walk of the principal street, and which hide nearly all the daylight from the shops which are here now and were there in the old days, I could only see, as Joseph Leopold did, the awful drama for which the scene still remains set. I saw the hunted fanatics as they were chased hither and thither, in and out of their poor shelter through three days. Footnote. I don't believe the authors saw anything of the sort. We were too much engaged in debating where we should eat. J L F M H and footnote. I saw the blood pouring, streaming from the knees of the stonework into the gutters, and heard the shrieks, now muffled, now piercingly audible, that must have come from the hollow of the pillars as these unhappy déséquilibrés, who had not been able to make the city of Zion a going concern, paid for their politics with their lives. Oh, Minster in Miss Failure is an old, hard, cruel place, and Minster is really Germany bigoted, self-centred Germany. As for the three, John of Leiden and Knipperdolling and another, there was, there could be, 
no mercy for them their hands were cut off their flesh was torn from their body by red-hot pincers they were flayed alive and then they were hung up by the neck in the iron cages i have spoken of and hitched up to the central tower and left to starve they hung there and the flesh melted off their bones and then the bones themselves dropped slowly down to the bottom of the cage and some of them fell through as i have said but there are no bones there now i swear though joseph leobald says he saw them there fifteen years ago i was cheated we went towards dusk into a grim council chamber with stained glass windows rather like the chapter house of durham cathedral there are stalls all round it and a small old moth-eaten velvet embroidered cushions set on the hard seats of those stalls and on those very velvet cushions nearly all the zomite of europe sat once on a time when they were met in minster to ratify the treaty of westphalia and end the thirty years war the man whose name is written on a script above the seat undoubtedly sat there footnote or his representative j l f m h and footnote and the labels speak of philip the fourth of spain the emperor ferdinand the third and louis the fourteenth of france half the population of germany perished in that war nine hundred thousand men were destroyed in saxony alone in two years the population of one town augsburg was reduced from eighty thousand to eighteen thousand and so on in proportion all over the land what makes people do it for people nowadays would not allow themselves to be killed off like that for a faith or even for money was war in those days really a trade and were the sure facilities of loot that had to be given to the soldiers of fortune the inspiring cause for there are now no church treasuries to rob and if there were soldiers would not be allowed to rob them or was it obedience to a blind natural law making for the reduction of populations that nations did for themselves the work of floods and pestilence we went to the queen of england and had the worst english restaurant dinner i have ever had either out of england or in it and away by the nine o'clock train and so ended our day incognito in minster end of section twenty section twenty one of the desirable alien at home in germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Cellar. Cellar, the early home of a Queen of England that was not to be, Sophia Dorothea, is just such another Browning town as Hamelin. As Joseph Leopold and I drank our coffee and munched sand cushion over a red checked tablecloth in front of the best and smartest inn of cellar, patronised and sealed as its respectable own by the automobile touring club as we sat in the hostelry at hamelin with signed firmans and framed mandates of that powerful company on the walls i felt for all the world as if we were under the same dignified auspices as at tours or evreux in france or warwick or ludlow in england and later on when we had penetrated farther into the smug little town of cellar and found the old florid out at elbows family hotel with its heavy gilt cornices and fusty rep hangings one thought of the old coaching inns at sandwich in kent or annick in northumberland the difference was that whereas even the distant northumbrian inn had brought itself painfully up to date with separate tables and exiguous portions served and delivered in an attempted french style the german hotel ordinary was still early victorian in amplitude and mode of cooking and serving we all sat at one long table with tourists sportsmen and commis voyageurs and whereas in england when replete that is to say quite stuffed with sawdust 
you sally forth to visit the ill-restored cathedral or the hopelessly ruined castle in germany there is nearly always a gothic cathedral or church well left alone and in full working order and a schloss in as good repair as it ever was with the roof on and a well that can be used and if you look for it in england there is generally a museum but you don't look for it you don't want to you know too well what you will see there a few vases a few geological specimens some section of saurian a model of a mine of a ship of a town hall and perhaps a saxon altar but in cellar at any rate you have not to look for a museum it is large new spick and span and planted opposite the entrance to the castle it is a very fine museum very airy high-pitched and light and not nearly so tiring to go over as most museums i think it is the dust that one imbibes that so fatigues and where everything was interesting well shown and cleverly placed i fixed my attention on what i shall never see in england though i have seen it in provence where the inhabitants of a show place are educated as they are in germany and take an intelligent interest in their own town and their own pasts as citizens for in france the ministère des beaux-arts in germany the state in one form or another steps in when something in the way of local historical evidence is disappearing and buys it up puts a moral fence against vandalism round it if it is not transplantable or if it is moves it bodily to a museum in the Alotron museum at al there is the entire reconstruction of a provencal mass furniture waxwork figures and the rest of it in cellar the society has done even better there is no papier mache idolen of the mouldering lodge of the past but the actual farm two actual farms bought up and placed in a museum there and there they are two peasant houses farms of a date certainly earlier than sixteen forty that the model remains the same the very needy woodman's cottage with its little light shining through the thick impenetrable forest to guide errant princes huntsmen and clever tailors to a shelter plank down lock stock and barrel in the lower hall of the cellar museum we see three out of the four walls like a grown-up doll's house stained with the smoke from the big fire in the very centre of the earth floor and the cook and the great pot slung on it the real household utensils shining bright are hung on the walls and the effigies of many hams hang from the rafters it has been used this room families have lived and died surrounded by these walls in the inner rooms are their sleeping arrangements shut in and curtained close all of them so that no air-loving englishman could sleep in such a hot bed the little candle of legend that flings its light on a naughty world and calls in adventure and sometimes misfortune from the wide waste stands against a square window on a shelf so that it may be seen as far as possible and at the very least tamely light the good man home and to exemplify the fact that the german peasant farmer chose and i believe does still choose to have his ox and his ass and everything that is his or his feudal lords within doors at night the buyer is next to the stube with only a door between the patient beasts the farmer's day-long companions of the furrow are gathered into his peace when all their work is done no distant defenceless stable for these good servants and stumbling pilgrimages over the rough cobbled yard at night by the light of an ineffectual lantern for him roused from his slumbers by a summoning moo or whinny i can imagine scenes like a nativity by rembrandt 
the good man sitting by his fire surrounded by his family in the one room among the flickering shadows and watching with the sleepy paternal eye of the shepherd the oily rafters of the stable and the dung floor that reflects no firelight rays listening though we cannot see in the dim penumbra to the patient ox nosing at the props of his stall and on christmas eve when as the legend says these humblest servants of all are granted the gift of speech in remembrance of the christ child who once deigned to lie in their midst nor scorned them i can fancy some mädchen or junker aware of the wonderful miracle that may even then be passing leaving his warm place in the light and stealing into the dim stable to listen to the beasts that speak then and then only on that night of memories and having lived with the peasant a while we came away and attuned ourselves to the greater final life of the prince the schloss of cellar is just opposite the museum in the old engravings we see it with a full moat and four large tourelles with sprightly flags flying at the four corners of all of them it is difficult to realize the defensible nature of this old building now that the flanking towers are gone replaced by ugly shapeless yellow buttresses that seem to lean up against the main fabric rather than support it the moat is filled up occupied by peaceful shell walks and low scrubby trees an old man who keeps chickens is custodian and his daughter shows you round he is an old army officer his military services have been thus rewarded that is the way they save the government's money in germany instead of giving a pension to a retired military man he is appointed to a nice soft place such as custodian of this kind or he is made a railway station master footnote it is the way they do it in england too or what a hampton court palace and chelsea hospital with their rooms and appointments for servants of the state for this in fact is the way international comparisons get written a german officer a d gets a pension like any other officer and although every railway official was once a soldier that is only because every male german is or was once a soldier the railway services belonging to the various states may be entered by any officer on his retirement from the army and if like major w dash whom our author has frequently mentioned he be a skilful engineer he will be employed to build new railway lines and may become in time chief engineer of one of the great systems which is of course a very good post but the same career is open to any civilian after he has performed his two or one years military service j l f m h end footnote inside there is no sign of rack and ruin the whole place gives the impression of cheer ease and comfort it reminded me of some old chintz covered lightly papered english country house there is plenty of faded tapestry of a french character hung on the walls of the lower rooms and covering the sofas in the upper ones the old paper still hangs on the walls and it is generally a chinese wallpaper such as one sees in english country houses with pagodas and strange long-tailed birds flying about among the twisted boughs at the very top is the theatre a round arena built into a square apartment the chapel is down below and there is caroline matilda's pew where she sat and mourned her fall and the duke of cellar's great pew where his daughter the other discrowned queen must have sat and worshipped in her happier days it was not far from here that she expiated her errors if errors they were and lived for thirty years as Princess of Alden. Sophia Dorothea's enthusiastic biographer, the late W. H. Wilkins, 
found his way to Alden on the marshes and gives a picture of it in his book. It is not very like a castle, it is more like a courthouse, which I believe it is or was used for. It reminds me too of a fortified Northumbrian manor house or rectory, such as I saw last year at Embleton and Elsdon. It is situated in an unhealthy low-lying marsh, so Mr. Wilkins told me, and flat it is for all the world like a piece of Cambridgeshire. From his description, I used to make myself see a characteristic scene, in spite by my knowledge of the curious tick Sophia Dorothea had for furious driving, a long low road stretching out over flat marshlands for six miles and crossing a little bridge at Hayden, and over this road, in an open carriage in all weathers, a lady with black hair and diamonds in it drives furiously backwards and forwards as far as the bridge many times in the day for thirty years. An escort of cavalry, their drawn swords flashing with another sheen than diamonds in the low light, rides always behind her. But no one, either in Hanover or Cellar, seemed able to tell me anything about Alden, and I had to give up the idea of seeing it except with the eyes of my head. It was only another schloss. Germany is studded all over with them. Germany would seem to have had more potentates to the square mile than any other country. I never realised, till I had lived in Germany, the true incidents of Prussian hegemony. A kingdom may occupy no more space than a good-sized pocket handkerchief, yet it boasts a schloss or palace in which the owner lives, or not, according to his fulfilment of the pact with Prussia. The Duke of Hessen-Darmstadt has a large patrimony, and plenty of other places, and his palace at Gießen makes a very useful barrack. The Prince of Lippe is Lord of a Spring, so he has instituted a cour. And as for architecture and appearance, palaces and schlosses are all different. Biberich, for instance, is like an English country house, a pale yellow mass of buildings built round a courtyard. Cellar was once fortified, as I have said, but it is so no longer. Hear what Caroline Matilda, the English princess, who dragged out her last weary years of banishment at Cellar, and prayed for resignation in the chapel there, said about the palaces she saw as she passed through Germany on her way to take up her royal state at Copenhagen as the wife of Christian of Denmark. I found her remarks in a little French version of her memoirs that I picked up on the quays in Paris. She was an alien, but hardly a desirable one, so her mother-in-law said. She seems to have had plenty of spirit, until they broke it for her in her country of adoption, beheaded her lover, the physician, and imprisoned her, till our ambassador, Lord Keith, insisted on taking her away. She wrote, she read. She had quoted Hamlet in England, apropos of her intended marriage, to be or not to be. That is, shall I marry Christian? And this is what she says about the sauvagerie of her father's German relations. Every two or three leagues, so she avers, we seem to pass into the territory of a different sovereign. Sometimes I went by without even discovering that I was in the capital town of yet another princeling. There they live, these counts and barons of the Holy Empire, in tumble-down castles with towers and turrets, and which they can only afford to half inhabit. They all brag of their illustrious ancestry, and when once I had seen their wretched places for myself, I was able to believe their boast, since it was plain they really had lived in them from time immemorial. There's more comfort and elegance to be found in the country house of a Londoner 
than in any one of these dreary abodes hung with rotten tapestries where some serene highness or other dies of ennui though he lives in all the pomp of a monarch with a suite people called écuyers grand écuyers high chamberlains and all unpaid unquote. she was evidently as the custom was put up for the night at some of these dilapidated residences or at any rate taken to the owners of them for she speaks contemptuously of their women quote, sitting inanimate in their own drawing-rooms like the wax figures that are kept at westminster Unquote. and we went on to osnabrück where a stage of the other hanoverian tragedy was enacted for when sophia dorothea the wife of our first george lay on her deathbed in the castle of alden she raved she denounced her husband the king of england and she wrote or dictated so the story says a letter to be delivered to him after her death and the same story says that it was delivered nine months afterwards to the king when he landed on his biennial visit to his other less important but more darling kingdom of hanover the receipt of it brought on the apoplectic stroke that he did not recover from moaning and crying out the red puffy unwholesome little old man put his head out of the carriage window and passionately urged the postilions forward osnabrück osnabrück he mumbled as his faculties became more and more bemused his brother was bishop of osnabrück and he wanted to die in the palace there he knew he must die a fortune teller had assured him long ago in england that his wife's death would only too surely herald his own it is hinted that sophia dorothea's own span might have been shorter and her existence made less tolerable if this superstitious idea had not taken solid root in the mind of george he was a mass of superstitions and his spirit kept its word and visited the duchess of kendal that is kielsmansegger the lady whose yellow cloak sophia dorothea had mocked after death she was used to swear that into the window of her room at richmond a white dove flew and that it was the ghost of her royal lover the shabbiness the vapidness as of an old battered tattered two shilling yellow back novel of osnabrück struck me to the soul and yet we stayed in it in a mouldering hotel very big very vast with enormous rooms opening through tall oppressive folding doors into other enormous rooms we slept in little cheap iron bedsteads that sneaked in the corners leaving vast unoccupied spaces of moth-eaten carpet where a bed with a baldachin and tester should have reared its proud head i was very glad it didn't though it was impossible to eat in the hotel there were only two restaurants in osnabrück and they were no better qua food than the hotel only the table linen was clean and mended it was a city of desolation to me but yet it was a handsome city it had parks and walks laid out on the ramparts and two churches and a bishop's palace the palace that george tried to attain to but did not there was nothing to do there there was not even a cinematograph one night we went to a smoking concert in a beer garden and heard miners sing through a long interminable programme and yet they sang very well in the afternoons we walked along one of the three straight allées laid out on the ramparts and stared at the queer reticent old bishop's palace on the other side one of these three allées had a board up bearing the words only for old ladies another was forbidden to old ladies and the third was reserved for cavaliers footnote i do not believe that these notice boards ever existed 
our author was probably hypnotized into seeing them by the english belief that such things exist in germany of course many notice boards exist in that fertile and regulated land in almost every public place you will read on one seat the words only for children and on the next forbidden to children perhaps once in brunswick city there was an ober tribunal procurator whose children put out their tongues at an infirm but disagreeable lady in waiting to the serenity such things happen then to avoid scandal between these important functionaries to avoid court intrigues the fall of ministries and possible revolutions the benevolent prince would order that children and old ladies should be separated and very sensibly too j l f m h in footnote there was probably some reason for this but i never discovered what it was or in which alley i was to walk supposing i as an old lady wished to visit a cousin at the end of the park in company with joseph leopold supposing i needed the support of his stalwart arm it could not be done i should have to walk in the allee that was only for old ladies he in that forbidden to my kind and the whole allee reserved for cavaliers would be between us end of section twenty one